Sue Campbell is one of the most influential people in UK sport today. After teaching in Manchester, she went to lecture at both Leicester and Loughborough universities. She's been at the centre of many of the changes that have happened to sport in schools over the last decade. She was chief executive of the Youth Sports Trust and now chairs UK Sport. Let's start off by talking about your own schooling. I spent more time out in the playground than I did studying. I did get my 11 plus actually. Yeah. I scraped through yeah. my 11 plus and I went to Long Eaton Grammar School. Right. Um, and I was certainly not an academic success. Yeah. I was in stream C or D most of the time. Yeah. I was very lucky. I had a very good physical education teacher. Uh, they were a husband and wife team. And in fact, it was... Um, Sheila Bassett, that was the name of the physical education teacher, who took me to one side in my third year and basically said, you know, what are you doing, going to do with your life here? Yeah. And I decided at that time that I wanted to teach PE because yeah. they were my, they were my yeah, they idols models. and role models. And she then explained in words of one syllable that I had to kind of knuckle down and do a little bit more academic yeah. work. So I did do that and I managed to get what were five O levels in those yeah. days. But what might have happened to you had that teacher not said that at that point in time? I probably, probably would have ended up in some trouble somewhere, yeah. significant yeah. trouble, I would think. A High statistic. energy, yeah. uh, poor concentration, uh, looking out the window all the time. Very active. Yeah. Often yeah. detention, after detention for naughtiness. Yeah. I was the kid on the edge. I mean, and I think today, you know, in today's culture, that kid is the kid who's close to exclusion, the kid who's, who's you know, behaviourally seen mm. to be put, se separated out because they're a, they're a trouble and they're a nuisance and all the other things. And I, you know, both in my own life and through the work we've done with um, a project that Sky's funded called Living for Sport, we've demonstrated very clearly that sport can be a an enormously powerful way of re-engaging those youngsters and diverting them away from what could mm. be a, a very destructive um, mm. illustration of, of of their energy you know and i think it's how mm. do you touch sports a wonderful way of using energy in a positive context mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you did go into teaching but you you taught only for <coughs> two three years in yeah Manchester. i did i did I've often said that although Bedford was an unbelievable professional training ground, it never taught me how to teach kids. Yeah. Wally yeah. Range taught me how to mm. teach kids. Mm. Through experience. Yes, yeah, so I, I mean, I know it's slightly humorous, and it, but it's a true story. My first netball lesson in Wally Range was with 4-0. There I was with my little plan on my clipboard all ready to go, and the bibs lined up and the balls lined up and the bell went, and I thought, this is it, I'm away. Yeah. I waited and I waited and nobody came. And I thought, oh my goodness, new teacher. I'm either in the wrong place. I'm, I, I thought for a minute I was in the wrong school. I thought, gosh, I should have been in the lower school. So I started to go up the corridor to check the ta master timetable. And as I was going by the toilets, I heard all this ruckus in the toilets. And of course, there was 4 0. Not the All in the to toilets, come out. right. And I said to them, uh, uh, hello, you, would you happen to be 4 0? And they all went, yeah, miss, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're all. Never been a fag. And he said, Can we put these out? And they said, Oh, and moaning and started putting them out. And they said, um, you, uh, Are you coming to PE? So, are you the new PE teacher? They said, Oh, no, we don't do PE. Right. I said, You don't do PE? They said, No, it breaks your nails. They said, I'll always remember it. They did that. And I thought, Nobody in Bedford ever told me how to deal with yeah. this. The realities of life. The realities of teaching some challenging young people. But what I did learn from them was really how to engage young people. Because, yeah. yeah, you know, I'd. I'd I'd been trained how to teach, I hadn't been trained how to engage. Yeah, right. And I think if we've learnt anything in physical education over the last 10 years, it's been we must engage people in their own learning. Yeah. Which happens in all subjects, yeah, to tell you the truth, across the curriculum. You, you work for the, the Sports Council, Regional Sports Council, but by, let's get to the, the, the mid-90s, the mid you, you then uh, find yourself operating on the, on the national stage. You, mm. And Youth Sports Trustee set up, you're invited to be the chief executive. The more I was looking at what we were doing in coaching education, the more I was recognising that less and less young people seem to be coming through the system. Yes. Yeah. Because looking back, there's a feeling that by the early to mid 90s, we'd, we'd lost it in terms yeah. of school and yeah. sport. They yeah. weren't doing the competitive uh, sports any longer. And there was a national feeling that something was wrong in school sport. Yeah. It wasn't, uh, you know, I want to point out, first of all, it wasn't the physical education teachers. They were still doing a good job, most of them, still working hard 
and still staying after school. Mm. But there'd been that teacher's action some time earlier where a lot of other teachers who had taken the football team or the tennis team, yeah. you know, the geography teacher and the maths teacher, had got other pressures on them, you know. Mm. Um, assessment, uh, preparation had increased, mm. and there'd been that teacher's strike, and there'd been this Start dropping away goodness. of people mm. staying. There'd been that whole business of competition was bad for kids, which had kind of rumbled around the system. There'd been play, set playing fields had been sold off, so mm. there was a sense that there was less places to play. Um, there was a push to get academics, you know, better, particularly literacy, numeracy. Mm. So sport was getting pushed further and further mm. and further down. So instead of it sitting at the heart of school life, it started to be very peripheral mm. to school life. Mm. We're a nation who loves sport, and yet we allowed a decade or more to go by when we persuaded ourselves sport in schools wasn't wasn't important. I mean, how do they, what was your explanation as to how those two things happened? One of the things I look back now and realise that when I taught physical education and when I trained people to teach physical education, I was often unwittingly working with the ones who were good at it and really not including the others. And, and you say that happens in every subject. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm sure people listening to this going, oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I hated hockey too. Yeah. You know, being bashed around the leg with a piece of stick. What, what fun was that? Yeah. So it appealed to a small, you know, 20, 30 percent, but there were an awful lot it didn't. But there was a big change sort of in the latter half of the 90s where there was an attempt to engage children who didn't like sport in sport. There was the issue about letting girls do dance rather than yeah. hockey. There's the issue about changing the school uniform, yeah, the PE uniform. Yeah. So wh where did all that come from? Where did that really a quiet revolution in sports curriculum actually come from? We can't underestimate the specialist sports colleges themselves and what they did. You know, we were very lucky with the first 11, if you remember. I mean, that sounds rather ironic, yes, but they were the first 11 sports colleges. I think you had about 20-odd when I first met you. Now we've got 439. Right. Um, they were very good at working with us, and, and we understood from the start that we were, our job was not just to make PE and sport better in those schools, but it was to help those schools show how PE and sport changed whole school standards. And we didn't know that either, did we? We, no. we knew that sport helped you to keep fit, but there wasn't the evidence that it also helped you to do better Correct. at reading and writing. I think if you look at sports colleges now, there's a lot to be learned by the relationship of good quality physical education teachers and their young people, mm. and what we can transfer into the classroom. Because in the specialist sports college, as in the others, uh, grades go up right across the curriculum, don't they? It's not just sporting results that get yeah, better. Yeah, I think it's the last two or three years, the sports colleges have been the fastest improving academically. They're not the highest because they start from a lower point. That's right, yeah. On average, we've got a lower point. But they are the fastest improving. And I think if you talk to the head teachers, they'll tell you that sport isn't an instant fix because it's about ethos, it's about motivation, it's about tackling self-esteem and values mm. in your school. And you're not, you don't change like that. But when you build that in and you start to use it very effectively, mm. you change kids' attitudes to want to being mm. at school and pride and self-esteem. And when those kids change like that, then they're more open to learning, more willing to learn. Mm. So I, I think it's had a big impact on standards, not just attainment, but achievement issues. Yeah. I think we've been describing reality, the, the huge change that's gone on in the last decade, the huge pre, um, improvement, the transformation of teacher skills and the very structure of where sport it's positioned in school. Only in the last month, I've read again in the press of how we don't do sport, we don't value sport, yeah, we're bottom of the world table. Do you, I mean, A, it must frustrate you, but do you know these people who, who write this stuff, why, why haven't they caught up with what's been happening over the last decade? No, it's, it's, a, it's a real frustration. I mean, we, we, we had a conference last week um, with all the partnership development managers because now, as you know, we've clustered schools into these 450 groupings. And we had the people who manage each of those relationships with a partner school. So we had over 1,500 people at this conference last week. And the can-do feel, the atmosphere, the energy is mm, fantastic. Mm. Could we get a journalist to it? They no. won't even turn up. They don't even come to it. And it is very frustrating. And, you know, in 2002, Ofsted uh, said that probably less than 25% of our kids were getting two hours of high yeah. quality PE and sport yeah. a week. By 2007, we've hit 86%, which was next year's PSA yes, target, target, one year early, thanks to this army of people marching in the mm. right direction. Mm. So there is a, a massive revolution happening, a real change. If you only to go out, you can feel it. So mm. all I can say to the, some of those journalists is either they're very lazy 
or they purposely try to find the one school where it isn't happening. Yeah, when your laws manage to find that. But, but if you go to the majority of schools, is it all right? No, I wouldn't be complacent at all. There's still a heck of a lot to do, and particularly in primary still. Yeah. But is it on the improvement? Absolutely. And those people you're describing now with the energy, of course, are teaching the youngsters who we hope will be Olympic medal winners in 2012 when the Olympics come to London. And that's a, another of your roles, not part of the Youth Sports Trust, but it's UK Sport, a separate yeah. organisation. To be in UK Sport, where I'm working with the preparation of our Olympic and Paralympic team for Beijing in London 2012, mm. is incredibly exciting. It's what I call the Formula One part of yeah. the of life. It's fast, it's dynamic, it's cutting edge, it's, it's at times kind of a combination of scary and exciting. Yes. But when you go so the pressure fast, is enormous and we've got stuff. to go at such speed. Yeah. Yeah. But also you've worked hard to try and make the Olympics mean something to more than the elite athletes and some of the, where you have managed to bring your two roles together is some of the Role, overseas yeah. work that you've done uh, with, with any youngster, not just the elite yeah. athletes. Just talk us through a, a bit about that. I know you, you care about the Olympic spirit and what the, it's meant to mean. Well, I, I, you know, the, 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 the wonderful thing about the Olympics is, is it's essentially about personal best. It's about you being your personal best. It doesn't really matter in what. The spirit of the Olympics is helping every child to be the best that they can be. Our international work is, is focused on the promise that Lord Coe made. And, and if you go back, and I remember sit, I'm sitting in Singapore listening to him do it, uh, it was a re remarkable presentation he did. It, was, it certainly won us the Olympic Games. There was a huge amount of work from the previous Prime Minister, Tony Blair, and others who made a huge mm -hmm. defining difference in those few days we were in Singapore. Yeah, to get so when we went there. to Singapore, we were not in front. Yeah. And three days later, we won the bid. There was some wonderful effort there by yeah. everybody. But Lord Coe's presentation, he said, if, if London wins the Olympics, we will use the London Olympics to, to bring sport to the lives of every young person in the UK and around the world. And it's the around the world piece that UK <laughs> sport has got yeah, a slight okay. chance of. And what we're doing there is we're working with a range of partners UNICEF, Right to Play, British mm. Council, Youth Sport Trust, obviously, and the Home Country Sports Councils. And UK Sport is leading that consortium. And we're going to work in 20 developing countries across the world. And our aim there is not so much the development of sport for the sake of sport, but the development of sport to tackle some of the bigger, much more demanding issues in developing countries. Um, mm. Women's empowerment, yeah. HIV AIDS, conflict resolution, mm. uh, the whole business of... Um, bringing cultures together. Um, mm. You know, if you look at systems in some countries, there are certain parts of um, certain cultural diversity there that is not, that needs some healing. Yes. And sport can be a healer. Mm. You know, Nelson Mandela said it's a language that everybody understands, and he, he, he's right. A global language. Absolutely. World, you, you, you drop a ball down in, in any country in the world, and whether I speak the same okay. language as you, I'll know what I'm doing with the ball at my feet. Yeah. And I think that's remarkable, and you can achieve yeah. so much. It really builds bridges and breaks down barriers mm. between nations, between people, between cultural, di you know, mm. diverse cultural groups. Sue Campbell, thank you very much. My pleasure.